Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. The federal carbon tax has gone up by 23%. We hear from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation about how that will impact you. A former Liberal cabinet minister says it may be too late for the Trudeau Liberals to stop their slide in the polls leading up to the next federal election in 2025. And swastikas are apparently now being seen at pro-Palestinian rallies in Europe. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Naftari will have the latest. Your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Monday was a day that many Canadians were dreading, an increase in the federal carbon tax. The federal levy is putting up the price of the pump by as much as three cents a liter. And for those of us who use natural gas to heat our homes, we will also see an increase on our bills. Now to chat about this in more detail is Franco Terrazano, Federal Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from Ottawa. Franco, the Trudeau government said, sure, the carbon tax is going up, but so will those rebate checks. Well, look, I mean, the parliamentary budget officer, the government's own independent budget watchdog, has done the math and shows that the carbon tax will cost the average family up to $911 more than they get back in rebates. So here's the truth of the matter. The carbon tax is making the necessities of life more expensive in Canada. The carbon tax makes it more expensive for you to fuel up your car. It makes it more expensive for you to heat your home. And the carbon tax is making it more expensive for you to buy food. And to add insult to injury, the federal government also charges its sales tax on top of the carbon tax. And that tax on tax alone will cost Canadians more than $500 million this year. So look, Trudeau should be providing relief and he should be trying to make life more affordable, but that's not what he's doing. His carbon tax and his carbon tax hike is making life more expensive here in Canada. Now, Franco, also on April the 1st, federal MPs saw a salary increase. You know, with so many Canadians struggling financially right now, perhaps now is not the best time? This is so tone deaf. I can't believe they're doing this. On the very same day that members of parliament take more money out of your pocket, they're going to be stuffing more money into their own pockets. So this year's pay raise will range from an extra $8,500 all the way up to an extra $17,000. So a backbench member of parliament, their salary will now be about $203,000. A minister's salary will be just shy of $300,000. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's salary will be about $406,000. And, you know, for that backbench MP, well, the National Post did some analysis and found that a backbench MP, when comparing apples to apples, is now the second highest paid elected official in the world. Thanks so much for your time today, Franco. That was Franco Terrazano, Federal Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from Ottawa. You know, if a federal election was held today, the Conservatives would win in a landslide. The latest polls show that the Tories have a very comfortable 15 to 20 point lead over the Trudeau Liberals. Many would argue that the carbon tax and the increase today is what's helping to fuel the Conservatives and Pierre Polyev's popularity, while at the same time hurting the Justin Trudeau Liberals. Dan McTagg is the president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. He's also a former Liberal Ontario MP under Jean Chrétien. He joins us now from Milton, Ontario. Dan, the increase in the federal carbon tax does not appear to be beefing up support for Justin Trudeau and his government. The parliamentary budget officer says even after the rebate checks that go out, most Canadians will pay more than what they're getting back when it comes to the federal levy. Well, it looks like the Liberals are com in complete denial. They don't really want to understand that this is a, a significant hit to the bottom line of every Canadian that's out there. This isn't about liking or disliking Justin Trudeau, liking or disliking uh, the Liberal Party, liking or disliking climate issues. This is about the ability for them to, to make ends meet. And, you know, how you and I have talked about this now for five years. I said a day would come. Given my experience as a Liberal member of Parliament for 18 years, 30 prior to that as a liberal in the in the trenches if you keep messing around with the ability for people to make ends meet you're going to wind up being defeated and that's exactly what is happening not many takers a few years ago there are a lot of them now 70 percent believe this carbon tax is a fraud it's hurting them and they want it gone so that's only one part of this the whole net zero issue is an even greater problem that uh, all politicians of all political stripes are going to have to tackle because if they think the low-hanging fruit of uh, carbon tax is something you can beat up you got another thing coming all the other programs under net zero are going to create equal hardship and continue to send Canada in a direction that no one ex expected. 
Do you think that the Liberals have a chance to maybe turn things around between now and the next federal election in October of 2025? Uh, no, I think it's over. Um, you know, Justin Trudeau stayed in far too long. His policies continue to remain. It's like a bad odor that continues to follow the party. The stench is something that most Canadians, even here where I am in Ontario, in the GTA in Toronto, have had enough of. Uh, you know, when it's when you speak to older liberals, quiet, uh, always voted for liberals, they know that uh, it's uh, it's pretty much over, except for the fanatical twitch of those who know that they're going to be gone in 20 months. Uh, you know, I think the new government in waiting, the Pierre Polyev government, should be uh, spending a lot more time on policy, develop, developing how they're going to turn this thing around in such a short period. Now, Dan, you believe that the Trudeau Liberals are a lot different from the Jean Chrétien Liberals whom you served under. Can you explain? Pragmatic at all. Uh, if they saw uh, an, an economic crisis of this nature, of a, an affordability crisis, piled on by, you know, higher housing prices, higher food prices, energy prices, the last thing they would want to do is be seen as contributing to that. So much so, Hal, and uh, you will probably remember this, in 2000, uh, I wrote a report on gasoline pricing in Canada to talk about competition. Part of that talked about a rebate to help Canadians. So Liberals at one point truly cared that, uh, you know, that uh, taxation policy wasn't being adversely used to hurt Canadians. Uh, and the bottom line really counts. It would appear that this government believes that it can use the excuse of climate hysteria in order to justify just about anything. But I think most Canadians are catching up to them, especially here in places like Toronto, where uh, the numbers continue to show the Liberals uh, are likely to be virtually wiped out in the next federal election if they don't change uh, quickly. And I think perhaps that time is gone for them. Former Ontario Liberal MP and current president of Canadians for Affordable Energy, Dan McTagg, Thanks so much for joining us today from Milton, Ontario. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev brought his axe the tax message to Nanaimo, British Columbia earlier today. Polyev says things are so bad after nine years of Justin Trudeau that Canadians are even fighting over food at certain food banks here in our country. Two million Canadians line up at food banks because they can't afford food. One third of food related bankrupts, food related charities are turning Canadians away because they've run into food. In Montreal, a couple of weeks back, there was a small riot after the food ran out and the police had to be called because there were too many hungry people on the streets clamoring for something to eat. In St. John's, in St. John's, Newfoundland, there are 28 dead bodies left in refrigerators outside of a hospital because families could not afford a funeral or cremation. Can you imagine that? leaving your aunt, your father, your sister, your brother in a freezer next to a dumpster at a hospital because you cannot afford to give them a dignified goodbye. You know, the federal carbon tax hike is raising the costs of most goods that we buy. BCN's Naveen Day spoke with officials at a local trucking company to get their reaction to the most recent increase. If you were surprised by the spike in price for fuel at the pumps on Monday morning, that could be just the start of further increases in the coming days. This is due to the reinstatement of Alberta's provincial fuel tax and the federal carbon pricing plan, which rose from $65 a ton to $80 a ton, both of which took effect on April the 1st. Al Nelson with CJD Trucking says his company's fuel costs have also risen. It didn't impact us a whole bunch. Our, our fuel actually just went up... Uh, about four cents a liter this morning, which isn't a huge impact. Uh, we'll be watching it and monitoring it as it goes up. Um, what we usually do is when it gets to a point, uh, whatever that point may be, we'll add on a, a fuel surcharge onto our rate and pass on the cost to our customers. Nelson adds that the four cent increase is likely due to the provincial fuel tax and that the federal increase has not set in with his suppliers and that the end users will be the ones paying more for everything that is delivered by truck. And everything, of course, is impacted by this. You know, everything you buy at the store, uh, it, it, the carbon tax isn't just a carbon tax. It, it's a tax on basically everything we use. So the end user being the consumer is going to be the one that's going to pay. The federal carbon pricing plan is set to continue to rise annually by $15 until it reaches $170 a ton by 2030. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. A man being bitten by a dog here in southwestern Alberta helped end up saving another man's life. 
Police in Tabor say they received a complaint last Thursday morning about a man who was bitten by a dog near the Tabor Sugar Factory property. Now, when officers arrived, they found a large Akita dog laying on a berm. As they got closer, they heard a 61-year-old man who was crying for help. It turns out the man got stuck in a muddy ditch and had been there for a couple of days. Police say his dog, aptly named Hero, stayed by his side helping to keep him warm and even fended off coyotes. Police were able to rescue the man and he's been treated in hospital with undisclosed injuries. Police say the other dog walker who had been bitten and received medical attention told police that under the circumstances he was understanding of the situation and was grateful that the owner of the Akita was rescued. The Lethbridge Hurricanes now trail their WHL playoff series 2-0 after falling to the Swift Current Broncos 4-3 on Saturday. The Canes lost Game 1 3-0 in Saskatchewan. Now the loss in Game 2 for Lethbridge was their 11th straight postseason loss dating back to 2019 and the playoffs. It was their fourth straight playoff loss to the Broncos. The best of seven affair now shifts to Lethbridge where the Canes will host the games 3 and 4 at the NMAC Centre on Tuesday and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in Scarborough, Ontario, just outside of Toronto, with details about a national food program for schools. The Prime Minister says his government will invest a billion dollars over the next five years to create this new initiative. We just know that when kids eat better, they do better in school. The teachers, advocates and volunteers I spoke with today know that and something I remember from my years as a teacher. When a kid walks up before class and says, I'm hungry, that means we all have more work to do as a school community, as a country, as a world. We want everyone to be able to eat well so they can reach their full potential. Prime Minister Trudeau says the National Food Program for Schools will help to provide meals for an additional 400,000 kids across the country. The pro-Palestinian rallies continue, now not just here in North America, but also in Europe. A recent report says swastikas were seen at a recent rally in London, England. London police allegedly said the swastikas were not necessarily anti-Semitic or showed a disruption of public order. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari has more. Now, obviously, any sane person would say, A, what does a swastika have to do with uh, a being pro-Palestinian? How does it help the Palestinian cause to put up swastikas? The only thing it's telling us is that these protests are not about being pro-Palestinian. It's about being anti-Jewish. It's about being anti-Semitic. It's about being against Jews all over the world, not just about land in Israel, not about policies in Israel, not about October 7th. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari will also have details on how ISIS is threatening to increase terror attacks here in North America. That's coming up in the second half of our program. The Israeli military has withdrawn from Gaza's main hospital after a two-week raid. It says it took out a number of Hamas terrorists who were operating out of the facility. Hundreds of people walked among the devastation with heavily damaged buildings and mounds of dirt that had been churned up by bulldozers. <laughs> كان كل واحد فيها قاعد بزاوية زي ما هو كله نزيف جسس طبعا لها سبعة أيام جز جسس متنفخة الحمد لله تمكنا إن نقدر ندفنهم يعني بصعوبة الجسس بدأت تدوب صارت هنا عنا مجزرة بيت خالي ضربوا البيت بالف ستة عشر قدروا ينسحبوا برا البيت ضربتهم صاريخ الزنانة the report surfacing that the Israeli military has a new weapon in the battle against Hamas, it says will change the trajectory of the war in Gaza. We have more now on this weapon called the Dagger from TBN Israel's Mari Shoshani. The Dagger is basically a smart sight, a component that attaches to a rifle and improves aim and target acquisition. This will change the face of the battlefield. But how? Let me explain. This sight is called apidion in Hebrew. It's not a normal optical accessory, like a laser or an iron sight. It's actually a fire control system. It allows the fighter to accurately hit moving targets. In simpler terms, unlike a normal sight, which gives the fighter a target according to which he can place his barrel, the dagger gives the fighter the ability to actually follow the target, lock onto it, and shoot it at the exact second that will ensure a hit. The innovative fire control system takes into account a variety of variables, from the direction and speed of the target's movement to the ballistics of the weapon on which it's assembled. The small computer inside analyzes all the data and calculates how to make a precise hit. 
The dagger is so sophisticated that it's able to predict the future location of the target and calculate when the target and projectile would coincide in the same location. Think about it. The chance of hitting a moving target with the first bullet, which is the most significant one, is low. But data from the war in Gaza shows us that when the fighter uses the dagger, a hit is four times more likely. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he's doing everything in his power to bring the hostages home who were taken captive by Hamas on October the 7th. Thousands of protesters, meanwhile, rallied in Jerusalem, urging him to resign. Thousands of Iraqi Christians celebrated the ancient Akitu feast. It marks the Assyrian New Year. The celebration took place in Dohuk, a semi-autonomous Kurdish region of Iraq. April 1st marks the beginning of the new year in the Babylonian and Assyrian civilizations. I feel proud to be a Syrian. I feel proud that hundreds of people from abroad, Assyrians from all over the world, are here back in their homeland to celebrate with their brothers and sisters that still live in the homeland to celebrate this huge day, our Assyrian New Year. Looks like quite the celebration. Well, it was a beautiful Easter Monday here in southwestern Alberta. The warm and sunny conditions will remain until about the midweek or so. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. Well, it was a warm and sunny start to the week. We were well above our seasonal average for southwestern Alberta, which is around 9 degrees. Tonight, expect a few clouds developing with a low near 6. Tuesday, it should be mainly sunny with a high expected near 21. Wednesday, cooling off slightly, but still quite warm with a high of 17. A low pressure system along with a cold front returns on Thursday, bringing clouds and showers and the mercury dropping to 3 degrees. Even cooler on Friday, expect rain mixed with snow and a high of only plus 2. Saturday, more rain is in the forecast with a high near 7. Showers and slightly warmer with a high of 9 degrees expected on Sunday. Now the average high for this time of year is 9 degrees with an average low of minus 4. The record high was 20 degrees set way back in 1966 and the record low was a very chilly minus 21 set back in 1975. The sun rose at 7.06 and will set at 8.04. Let's see how Tuesday is shaping up across our home and native land now. Expect showers and 14 degrees in both Victoria and Vancouver. A mixture of sun and cloud and a balmy high of 21 for Edmonton. Mainly sunny and 16 is on tap for Calgary. Sunshine and 11 degrees is expected in Regina, Saskatchewan. Mainly sunny and 7 degrees for Saskatoon on Tuesday. In Winnipeg, it should be mainly cloudy and a high near 5. In the central part of the country, expect periods of rain and a high of 8 degrees in Toronto. A mixture of sun and cloud and 11 degrees for Ottawa. A clear sky and 10 is on tap for Montreal on Tuesday. In Atlantic Canada, it should be mainly sunny and 9 degrees in Fredericton. A few clouds developing in a high of 8 in Halifax. Rain mixed with flurries in a high of 2 degrees in Charlottetown. And in St. John's, expect flurries or rain showers with a high as well near 2 degrees on Tuesday. The federal carbon tax went up another $15 per ton today. The price change means filling up a 50-liter tank with gas will cost another $1.65. A natural gas heating bill will rise out just over $5 a month. And filling a propane tank for your barbecue will cost an extra $0.55. Cents. The federal government is also adjusting the Canada carbon rebate to reflect the higher carbon costs starting with the next payment on April the 15th. For example, a family of four in Alberta will see the quarterly payment increase by about $64.00 while it'll go up about $36 in Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. 
Many would argue, however, including the parliamentary budget officer, that Canadians will actually pay more than what they receive back in rebate checks. The Bank of Canada released its business outlook and consumer expectation surveys. Both show increased optimism amid an overall expectation that interest rate cuts are close at hand. While firms do not report weak demand, indicators of business conditions, sales outlook and employment intentions improved after several quarters of decline. Around 67% of Canadian consumers are cutting or postponing spending due to high inflation and interest rates, but they are less pessimistic about the future of the economy. Well, it is tax season right now. Many of us are busy collecting documents and receipts needed to file our income tax returns for last year. Financial expert Kent Prestige says it's very important to file when taxes are due or you could face some serious financial penalties if you owe the government money. If you have a business, it's uh, June 15th, but for most people, it's April 30th. And uh, the penalties, uh, you want to file on time. Uh, if you're late filing, it's a 5% penalty on the amount of tax that you still owe. And also, if you're late filing for a whole month, each additional month, they add another 1% to it. And on top of that, uh, the compound interest uh, daily at 10% for this year. So you want to file on time, especially if you owe taxes. Get more valuable tax advice from Ken Prestige, owner of Prestige Consulting, as he chats with BCN's Jeanette Roche, coming up later in our program. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 18 points on the day to finish at 22,185. The Dow was down 240 points to 39,566. The S&P 500 was down 10 on the day to 52.43, and the Nasdaq was up 17 points to 16,396. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 77 cents to 83.95 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 8 cents to $1.84 US. Gold was up 21.13 on the day to 22.51.24 US an ounce, and silver was up 12 cents to 25.08 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $8.27 per bushel, barley's at $6.36, canola's at $14.37, and corn is at $7.42 per bushel. Live cattle were down $4.93 to $1.8008. Feeder cattle were down $6.70 to $2.4043, and lean hogs were up $0.33 cents to $86.95. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $73.69 US. Recapping one of our top stories, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced details of a national food program for schools. The PM says his government will invest a billion dollars over the next five years to create this new initiative. Trudeau says the national food program for schools will help to provide meals for an additional 400,000 kids across the country. Swastikas are now apparently being integrated in some of the pro-Palestinian rallies in Europe. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari from the Foreign Desk We'll have more details for us momentarily. Listen, when you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. Henderson Lake Park Run invites all to throw on a pair of runners and participate in a free weekly computer-timed and recorded 5-kilometer walk, jog, or run. The Park Run is one of 2,100 park runs held around the world. Dogs on leashes and kids in strollers are welcome too. The Park Run begins at the Kinsman Picnic Shelter at 9 a.m. every Saturday. To register, visit parkrun.ca. Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered recovery program for any hurt, hang-up, and habit. This group meets Friday nights at Park Meadows Baptist Church. The evening begins at 7 p.m. with a large group session, followed by small groups at 8 with coffee and dessert at 9. For more information, visit CelebrateRecovery.ca or call Park Meadows Church office at 403-327-4422. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. As you've heard on Bridge City News, there have been a number of pro-Palestinian rallies around the world. Protesters demanding that the war in Gaza comes to an end between Israel and Hamas. 
But now here's the first. Some protesters are actually flying swastikas at the rallies, including one which took place recently in London, England. Now, to chat about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert and the host of the Foreign Desk, Lisa Daftari, joining us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, I never thought I would see the day that someone would refer to Israel and the Jews as Nazis, but here we are. And apparently some of the police in London say the display of a swastika is not necessarily anti-Semitic or a disruption of public order? It's, it's horrific. Uh, this one woman, and we'll talk about this one example and then move out broader. This one woman um, was just observing all of this and she goes over to the police and says, oh my gosh, there's swastikas here. And they told her to take it into context, put it all into context, meaning around October 7th, he's basically saying it's okay to have a swastika. Now, obviously, any sane person would say, A, what does a swastika have to do with uh, a being pro-Palestinian? How does it help the Palestinian cause to put up swastikas? The only thing it's telling us is that these protests are not about being pro-Palestinian. It's about being anti-Jewish. It's about being anti-Semitic. It's about being against Jews all over the world, not just about land in Israel, not about policies in Israel, not about October 7th. And then this is horrific to have police actually not protect Jews or those who are there to support the land of Israel or to support the Jewish people. It is getting very, very scary. This is not the only example. I saw a lot of examples over Easter weekend when they were disruptive. They were, you know, trying to intimidate, cause fear um, all across the board. So again, I ask the question, if you are in fact in favor of a better future for the Palestinian people, how does any of this violent and very bigoted behavior help the cause uh, of the Palestinian people. It's, it's really horrific. Let's talk about one of those interruptions here for just a moment, Lisa. Pro-Palestinian protesters interrupted an Easter vigil mass that took place at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York over the weekend. Let's talk more about that. Right. Yeah, if you uh, were able to watch the footage of any of this, we had this up at the Foreign Desk, the videos. Um, it's just scary to watch how... Um, there is no respect for whether it's the dropping of the ball at Times Square or even in this case, even more horrific, St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is the um, eminent, you know, uh, Easter service in the United States. That church is so symbolic in the middle of, of, of New York City. Um, and, and to see that there is no respect for the, this holy day. Um, I spoke at a Christian university this last week, and it was amazing to see so many of the Christian students see this. All of this attack, the anti-Semitism all around the world happening all over, they saw it as an attack on Christians as well. And I think that that point is very much lost. This is not just to get about land in Israel. This is not. This is a, 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 a jihad against the West. And so much of that is lost. I mean, again, we're talking about the extremists. There are very well-intentioned people who are fighting for the Palestinian people and a better future for the Palestinian people. And I hope that those people are able to call out the radicalism, call out Hamas, and want a future for the Palestinian people away from radicalism, away from terrorism, and away from Hamas. But in this case, we have to call a spade a spade. Disrupting a service at St. Patrick's Cathedral does nothing for the Palestinian cause. It actually takes away from the Palestinian cause, and it ruins the name of a, a, a movement that would actually help the future of the Palestinian people and actually help there be peace and coexistence in the Middle East. So, I mean, I don't know how this will end, how this will be reined in, but we're seeing it everywhere on the streets in Canada, on the streets of New York City, on the streets of London and Los Angeles, on, on campuses, at, in Congress, all throughout the world. So I, I really do hope that those who really want a better future for the Middle East, for the Palestinian people, for the Jews living side by side, will call out this behavior. You know, it appears as though U.S. President Joe Biden has changed his tune somewhat on Gaza, shifting his strategy on the Israel-Hamas war amid a looming threat from activist groups and his voters ahead of the November federal election. Right. So there are there's a movement throughout um, the, the left uh, to boycott or to step away from 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 supporting Biden, and many of those people are in swing states. So this is purely about votes. It's not about where the United States stands on policy. It's not traditionally our policy. It's not our strategic, it's not in our strategic interest to step away from, from supporting Israel fully. Um, again, I, I think many people don't understand the relationship between Israel and the United States. It's not a Democrat or Republican uh, position. It's a position of strategy and, and, and security. It's a position of having Israel as our only democratic ally in the region. 
uh, and working together with Israel. We give that aid money to Israel because there is a partnership there. The United States benefits from that relationship. Uh, so the, the bullying, the intimidation to stop with the Israel support, um, it, it's very damaging and it will far outlast uh, the Biden administration. And that is why we said the same thing under the Obama administration, that supporting Israel is part of our foreign policy. It's not a left, right or center issue. Uh, and, and throwing Israel on the, under the bus the way that President Obama did um, had long lasting uh, uh, ramifications. We saw President Trump obviously have a close relationship with Israel. The Abraham Accords came about. Again, when when these two are aligned, we have a better chance at bringing that stability and security to the Middle East, better chance for the Palestinian people as well. Uh, so, you know, what, what's happening right now is very short sighted, of course, leading up to the election. I think the Biden administration is very scared. They want to capture those votes. But what they don't understand is when people that are boycotting the Biden uh, campaign, say from the river to the sea, these small concessions regarding Israel policy, uh, not going to help. They want Israel off the map. And that is not something that the United States is going to do or support. No one should support that. Uh, so it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's an election year. So we have a lot of, of, of crazy news. Yeah, we'll see how it all plays out here. Lisa, the Washington Free Beacon is reporting that the Biden administration remains committed to supporting the main Palestinian assistance organization at the UN, UNRWA. Now, this despite the fact that there are concerns that the group may be helping to fund the terrorist group Hamas. Right, and we know that, that there were several uh, UNRWA employees who actually actually participated in the October 7th attacks. Now, according to Israel's account, there are more than 400 UNRWA member, mem employees who are part of, of Hamas or members of Hamas. And we know that 12 or 13 of them approximately participated in the attacks themselves. That is why the United States decided to withdraw its support for UNRWA. Some other states um, followed suit. Then again, some countries started uh, giving them uh, support again, uh, but the United States has remained committed to not supporting UNRWA because of the fact that they're involved with Hamas. Now, those are the headlines, right, Hal? Behind the scenes, it seems as though, according to this report by the Free Beacon, that the United States is still working behind the scenes with UNRWA, which goes to show, I mean, who can we trust here? Did they just say that they're withdrawing aid because of the headline, because they wanted to do what is right? on the surface, but then behind the scenes continue to work with a, a, a UN organization that is being funded by US taxpayer money that is involved with an actual terror organization that is on the United States FTO, which is the foreign terrorist organization list. Make it make sense. <laughs> French government officials announced over the weekend that their government would introduce a United Nations resolution calling for an end to the war in Gaza and, Lisa, the establishment of a Palestinian state. Now, the draft also apparently includes condemnation for the October 7th attacks and for Hamas to release the remaining Israeli hostages. You know, they can draft up as many resolutions as they'd like. I don't know who's going to go along with this, but certainly we know Hamas will not go along with it. It, it, it's, it's funny on its face because I will tell you how so many people across the world, whether in formal positions or informal protesters on the streets, are calling for a ceasefire. But people don't realize how many ceasefire proposals were all rejected by Hamas. The, most, the latest one was actually the most lopsided deal in favor of Hamas. They would get about 700 or 800 prisoners out of Israeli uh, jails in exchange for only 40 of those hostages. And they said no. That was a ceasefire offer, and they said no. So now we're going back to the UN for, for France, of all people, to come out and say, well, we want there to be two states, because now we, we want to reward Hamas at the helm of the Palestinian people. We want to reward them with a state because they committed October 7th massacre. It makes no sense. Neither side is prepared to acknowledge two states. And um, the ceasefire, well, they're not ready to give back those hostages. We're, we're coming up on six months of this nonsense, and they're not going to give up those hostages. There are men that I, I know the family of one of those hostages is over 85 years old, um, and they are very worried. He has not gotten the proper medical care he needs, not gotten the medication he needs. And here we are. You know, Lisa, I'm wondering how many of those hostages are even still alive. Maybe that's right. why... They couldn't give 40 hostages, you know, because maybe they're not even right. around anymore. I pray right. that's not the case. An Egyptian man was arrested in connection with a foiled Islamic State terrorist attack on the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, Lisa. 
The man in his early 60s was indicted on the charge of criminal terrorist association and put in pretrial detention last month. Right. So again, another example of the fixation on a, 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 a an iconic establishment representing Christianity, representing art, re representing history. No regard. This is an attack by allegedly ISIS. Um, we saw an attack by ISIS in, in, in Russia, and now one here. And just this morning, a uh, United States um, um, terror expert gave his testimony on what, why he believes there will be an ISIS attack in the near future uh, in the United States. And let's pray that he is wrong. Um, they're everywhere. Again, when we are focused on different things, right? So first it was Russia, Ukraine, then we're now our focus is on Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, ISIS gets to uh, beef up its own assets and continue to do its one-off attacks in different places in the world. And look where they're fixated, Hal, on churches, on concert halls, places where people are, again, representation of the West, um, representation of culture, of history, of religion, of Christianity, of Judaism, of all the things that are the uh, underlining um, foundation of our Judeo-Christian, um, you know, culture here in the West. Uh, so, you know, again, there, it's time for the West to wake up. Canada, the United States, Europe, the United Nations, we need to have better policies in place to truly curb the growth uh, of these terror entities. Are we hearing from more Islamic groups condemning a lot of the tax by these other terrorist groups such as Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, Boko Haram, who have a lot of connections to Islam. Are we hearing from more of the Muslim groups saying, you know, enough's enough, that's not what true Islam is all about, it's about peace. You know how you're a journalist and you're a classically trained journalist and you know what it's all about. If it bleeds, it leads. So what we do here are the voices of those imams that are calling for more October 7th type attacks, more attacks against the Jews. Uh, there were a few uh, imams over the weekend that said, you know, Easter is a great time to attack, you know, Jews and Christians. And, but there are groups that are calling for coexistence. There are groups that are calling out October 7th, but we don't hear from them. There are individuals, there are actual Palestinian individuals. Of course, their lives are being threatened. Of course, they have to have 24-hour security, but they are calling out what is happening, all the violence and, and, and October 7th. Um, but unfortunately, we don't hear enough of them, and they're not leading the conversation, but they should be. We should hear it, their voices, and we should, we, should, we should lean on those people to take us forward. Even those, if you recall, months before, or weeks before, I should say, October 7th attack, there were Palestinians Palestinians inside Gaza that were protesting Hamas. But they were, of course, their lives were on the line. Of course, they kill protesters. They don't, they, they have no regard for life. There's no freedom of speech. There's no freedom of writing. There's no, there's no right to your own political opinion or opposition or dissent. Um, but we don't hear enough from, from those individuals. Of course, they are either silenced or, again, it doesn't get the headline because it, it's, you know, out of the ordinary. It's, it's nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, we are hearing from a lot of these more violent voices that are, unfortunately, whether it's on social media, where it has a very far and dangerous reach or from their, their, their different platforms. U.S. President Joe Biden declared Easter Sunday, Lisa, as Transgender Day of Visibility. Now, Biden is calling on all Americans to join in lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout the nation to eliminate violence and discrimination based on gender identity. But let me ask you something. Why Easter Sunday and not today, Monday, or even on a Tuesday? Right. So um, there was huge backlash on this, right? Those who observe Easter, those who even don't observe Easter, but thought it was a, a crazy juxtaposition to have it be on that day. There are others who are saying, well, it's going to be March 31st every year. So this year it fell on Easter Sunday, but next year it won't. Um, because obviously Easter is going to be on the, the Sunday after daylight, so, you know, at the end of the month, it, it's, it's always a different date. Um, Regardless, it was a bad look. Regardless, it was the wrong time to connect these two things. Um, let Easter be Easter. You know, even, you know, a friend and, and, and myself were having this discussion yesterday where, you know, why are there so many shops that are open on Easter Sunday? And when I was growing up, you know, on the East Coast, I, I, nothing was open on, on, on Easter Sunday. Nothing was open on Thanksgiving. Nothing was open on Christmas. And that's the way it should be because, we are, are we're in a country that that those are the national holidays. There has to be some difference, um, but now we're seeing that, that that that's not the case. You know, it doesn't feel like Easter. It doesn't feel like you know. And when you have the 
leader, the, the you know, our president, not giving that space to have Easter be its national holiday. Of course, there was a lot of backlash, I think, from a lot of different people who may have respect for the, you know, trans community, but didn't feel like this was the proper way uh, to, to have it be on the same day. Perhaps this is the reason why a lot of people look at our countries as becoming more of a secularist society instead of leading more towards the traditional religious holidays like you mentioned, right? Foreign Affairs expert and host of The Foreign Desk, Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us once again from the City of Angels. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Hal. Well, it's hard to believe, but tax season is here once again already, and almost inevitably there will be changes from last year but it won't make things any less confusing. Today's guest has some advice on how to prepare your taxes and hopefully save some money along the way. Kent Prestige has decades of experience preparing taxes. He is the owner of Prestige Consulting and is also an instructor at Reeves College in Lethbridge. Uh, great to have you on again with us, Kent. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so first off, when do personal taxes need to be filed and what is the penalty if you end up filing late? Well, uh, April 30th for most people. Uh, if you have a business, it's uh, June 15th, but for most people it's April 30th. And uh, the penalties, uh, you wanna file on time. Uh, if you're late filing, it's a 5% penalty on the amount of tax that you still owe. And also if you're late filing for a whole month, each additional month, they add another 1% to it. And on top of that, uh, the compound interest uh, daily at 10% for this year. So you want to file on time, especially if you owe taxes. Yeah, uh, yeah I was just going to say, and those fines are for if you are owing. If you're getting money back, uh, there's not a penalty. Right? There, there's no fine if you're getting money back, uh, except for, you know, you'd rather have your money in your hands right now, I would yeah. assume. The sooner yeah. the better, right? Make some That's summer right. plans with it. <laughs> Why exactly. not? Exactly. Okay, yeah. so Kent, many people today just use tax software to file their tax returns. So um, sometimes it might be worth hiring a tax professional, though, to do the preparation. So why is that? Well, um, I'll just tell you a little story here. I had a client one time who bought his own uh, tax software and he filed his own tax returns. And then just for fun, he said, I want you to file, I want you to do my tax return for me. And I got $1,500 back more for him than he uh, did on his own. And the difference was he didn't know what to claim. He didn't know what some of his exemptions were, didn't know what some of the credits were that he could claim, and he missed things. And uh, it was actually $1,500 difference. So uh, uh, he was client for quite a few years. He then moved away. So uh, okay. he's not my client anymore. But uh, certainly it does tell you that uh, you really, software is great. It'll do the math for you and it'll remind you about some things. But you still have to have a body of knowledge uh, behind you so you know what to uh, what to claim. Yeah, that was a good lesson for him, definitely, and, and for our viewers as well. Uh, so, Kent, ever since the COVID pandemic, there have been a lot more people working from home. And up until now, the CRA had a simplified method simplified method of yeah. claiming home office expenses, but things have changed this year. So can maybe you explain a little bit of, about what these changes are? Sure. So the uh, simplified method was uh, if you were working at home during the, the pandemic, uh, you were allowed to claim $2 a day up to a maximum of $500 um, uh, for home expenses while you were uh, working from home. Uh, this year, they did away with that. They went back to basically the old way that you would normally have had to have claimed those expenses. Uh, you'd have to have the company that you work for sign a 20, uh, 2200 a form, a T2200. And that form is, um, it, it allows you to claim expenses for working from home. Then now you have to keep track of all of your expenses. So Let's say you set aside an office and it's 10% of your home, which is quite typical. Most people would take a bedroom and set it up as an office. 
And that's usually about 10% of your home. So you can claim 10% of your utilities, 10% of your interest, 10% of fire insurance and any expenses that have to do with your home. You can also claim uh, a cell phone and other expenses like that. But again, now you have to have records to prove all of these expenses. Whereas last year, it was just uh, $2 a day, $500, no matter what uh, you claimed as expenses. Right, exactly. Okay, now I understand that there is an opportunity for first time home buyers with the first home savings account to save for a, a down payment. Yeah, actually, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, it's very similar to an RRSP. Uh, you can put up to eight thousand dollars a year into this home, this first homes uh, program, and up to a maximum of forty thousand uh, dollars. If you take that money, well, so it's sheltered from tax, so you don't pay tax on it while it's in there. When you take it out, if you buy a house with it, you don't have to pay tax on that money at all, which is a really good deal. Forty thousand dollars. Uh, you know, with no tax on it at all. So that's a pretty good deal uh, for a first time homeowner. Yeah. And it's such a great way to save as well. Exactly. Wonderful. You're saving on the tax as well as uh, saving for a house. Exactly. A kind of a win win there, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. So are there, are there potential tax implications when you buy or sell a home? Speaking of home buying. Yeah, there's there's some new ones that have just come out here. Like uh, if you uh, live in your house and you sell your house, there's no tax on that, at least currently. The liberals may change that. But at this point, there's no tax when you sell your the house that you live in. But they're bringing in new rules against anti-flipping, uh, where people will buy a house, they'll renovate it, uh, and then they'll sell it. Now, you used to be able to claim the income that you would make on that as a capital gain. Well, capital gains tax treatment is better than regular income tax treatment. Uh, now there's, if you if you own a house for less than a year, it's gonna be treated as income, which is taxed at a higher rate. Uh, so they're trying to, uh, you know, discourage people from buying a house and flipping it. Although it's still a great way to make money. It's just not quite as good as it used to be. Oh yeah, that's too bad for sure. Yeah. So any tax advice then to landlords who rent out their basement or rent out another house? Okay. So first bit of tax that I usually tell somebody that's renting either a part of their home or, or renting a house or anything like that is uh, don't take depreciation or it's called capital cost allowance on it um, for tax purposes. Uh, because what happens is when you sell a house, typically in the future, uh, you're going to make a capital gain on it, which may bump up your, your tax bracket already by doing that. And then most houses don't lose value. They gain value for the most part. There are situations where they might lose money, but for the most part, they gain money. So then you have to reclaim all of that depreciation that you've taken over the years. When you reclaim it, it's taxed as regular income. So it could put you in a really... Um, serious tax situation, we'll say, uh, if, if you uh, do that. So that's the first thing. Second thing that I want to talk about when it comes to renting out a house, make sure you claim all your expenses. Uh, you're allowed to claim your the property tax that you pay. You're allowed to uh, claim any of the expenses that are legitimately towards the house. Uh, so make sure you claim them. I've had people forget about their insurance or something like that. And so you give them a phone call, remind them, and then they have to go search for it. But the fact is, claim the expenses that you're allowed to, to keep your income as low as possible. Okay, great advice there. Uh, let's talk about charitable tax donations. How beneficial is this? How much, how much would it save on your taxes? Uh, uh, actually, probably one of the best things that you can do is, is uh, donate to a charity when it comes to tax treatment. Um, the only thing that's maybe better than that is if you donate to a political party, but the, the politicians take care of themselves. But for a, a standard donation to a charitable um, uh, institution, a church or something like that, uh, the first $200, uh, you're going to get a 15% uh, tax write off on that. But anything over that, it, it jumps up exponentially. For example, um, anything over $200 automatically goes to 39%.
And if you were, and then if you get into the really high brackets, uh, you can actually get, uh, um, I sorry, it goes to 29%. If you get into the higher tax brackets, it could go to 33%. Um, so anything over $200 at the 29% rate, you may not even be paying 29% because you're not in that marginal tax bracket. So there's actually a, a, a really good uh, advantage to giving to charity. Mm, yeah, no kidding. Um, and we were talking about uh, write-off expenses before about how, so what about childcare? Can we deduct childcare expenses from our income? Certainly can, okay. uh, yep. And it, it's a, a very good uh, write-off. So again, if you're paying um, a, a daycare or, or something like that, make sure you keep your receipts. Uh, make sure you turn them into your accountant so that they can claim it on your tax return as well. Okay. How about moving expenses? Moving expenses, yes, with some uh, caveats there. Uh, you have to move for business, and uh, pretty well you have to move out of town. You have to move to another town. But if you do move, again, make sure you keep all of your receipts. And not just for the moving company. Make sure you keep uh, kilometers for the trip that you did in your own personal car because you can claim that. If you have to stay in a hotel, make sure you claim the hotel bills. All of those type of expenses uh, can be claimed. And again, that's going to reduce uh, your taxes for that year. But it has to be a move for business. Right. Oh, great advice there. Okay. So, Kent, is it worth keeping medical bills to cl claim as a deduction? Well, the deal on medical bills is um, you can claim anything over 3% of your income. So, there's this uh, limit on it. So, for example, if you, I'll just calculate, say you made $50,000 uh, times point you would have to have more than $1,500 worth of um, um, tax receipts before you could claim anything. So for the average person, you know, $1,500 worth of medical expenses is, is quite a bit. Um, but again, if you are a senior, then it's well worthwhile, um, you know, keeping them because your income's lower, eh? So again, it depends on your income. It's 3% of your income, whatever your income is. So you want to make sure that, uh, um, you know, but keep them. If, you know, if you buy glasses, a pair of glasses right now could be $800, right? Exactly. And you never know what what other expenses and, might come yeah, up during the year. Yeah, it could really add up to that. And I mean, before you know it. There you, there you go. And by the way, Kent, how long should a person maybe hang on to their tax documents for? Well, legally, you're required to hang on to them for six years, but you also need to keep your current years. So it's really seven years, uh, and then you can throw out uh, anything. But the other thing about taxes is actually your, your tax returns are statute barred after three years, which means... Uh, Revenue Canada can't open up a tax return that's more than three years old unless you ask them to. So if you ask them to open it up or if they fi find that you've done something illegal, then they can open up uh, going back further. But really, for the most part, uh, you know, uh, they're not going to go back more than three years. OK. What advice do you have for someone thinking about investing in an RRSP or a TFSA? Well, um, first of all, balance the amount between the two. Um, I used to be really a real promoter of RRSPs until I went to a senior's home and talked to some of the seniors that were in there, and they had subsidized rent in this particular senior's home. So as soon as you claim, as soon as you take money out of an RRSP, it becomes taxable income, and in that case, it raised their rent. So these guys, right off the bat, a third of it was going in tax. Then a third of it would uh, there was increasing their rent. So in the end, they didn't like RRSPs at all. But that's a rare case. For most people, an RRSP is good. What you have to remember is that it defers tax. It doesn't eliminate tax. You pay the tax, you just pay it down the road. On the TFSA, what I love about a TFSA is that uh, you put money away, you don't get a tax bump right at the beginning, but any money that's earned in the fund is tax-free. And when you take the money out of the fund, um, uh, it's not going to affect your taxable income. 
So again, if you're a senior, you take some money out of your TFSA, it doesn't increase your taxable income. If it doesn't increase your taxable income, it doesn't affect things like the GIS uh, or your OAS or any of the other pensions that you might be receiving. So, so there's a benefit pay, you, to both you, of them. You either pay now or pay later, depending on what yeah, you Yeah, it's sort of like the old uh, car commercial where they talked about an oil filter. You can either pay me now or pay me later, right. uh, but way, you're going to pay, pay taxes. The only <laughs> only things in life that are for sure are death and taxes, right? So Exactly. Okay, so if a person normally receives money back from the government after filing taxes, I understand that you can request a, a reduction in the tax withheld from your pay so that you can have less taxes deducted from your paycheck the following yeah, year. Yeah, this, this is really true, and it, it, it certainly applies to um, people who are very charitable. Very, they give a lot of money away. Um, so what you can do is after you've donated quite heavily for a year, uh, Revenue Canada then has a record that you're a regular donor. Uh, and so you can send them a letter in year two and say, I'd like to reduce my taxes at source based on the charitable giving that I do. They will then send a letter that you give to the, your employer and your employer can reduce your taxes at source rather than having to wait for a whole year to get that tax return. So Wow. Uh, lots of advice there, lots of great advice, and lots to think about for sure, especially during this tax season as we're all thinking about getting our, our taxes filed. Kent, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Kent Prestage is the owner of Prestige Consulting and is also an instructor at Reeves College in Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks so much for watching.